Welcome. This is the Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives on Wednesday, May 19th, and we are looking at H106, which is on the notice calendar today, back from the Senate. And um, Jim Damaray is going to walk us through the changes uh, using a side by side. So thank you, um, Jim Damaray. Okay, good morning. Um, for the record, Jim Damaray, that's console. We are walking through this side by side of, um, let me get up here, of um, H26 uh, as passed by the House versus as passed by the Senate. House is on the left side, Senate's on the right side. Differences are in yellow. Um, so um, I, won't, I won't focus on. Like they put in um, rear assistance, you, you'll see here. Um, I won't focus on those small changes, but so they've got um, changes to the findings. Um, so you can see here that um, they've expanded, expanded your finding number one. So their version of it would read every child should be provided with an equitable education as defined by the age, as defined by the agency of education as access to the resources, opportunities and educational rigor they need at the right moment in their education, wherever their race, gender identity, sexual orientation, ethnicity, religion, uh, language, uh, disability, family background, or family income may be. Um, and then um, they go on to uh, just modify your language that every child should be able to grow up with the opportunity to, to achieve their dreams. Uh, and then uh, it says our, our public schools must be designed and equipped to fully deliver on that promise. So kind of an expand version of what you have here on the left-hand side. Um, so that's the first uh, difference to point out. Then um, two is the same, except like they've added uh, language at the end. Um, so this is talking about uh, um, low-income students and um, uh, the result of, of, of challenges from that. Uh, they've kept in your language, but then they say, uh, recognizing that students need fresh and institutional foods to enable them to focus on their education and that many students come from school hungry. Uh, providing universal school meals offered at no cost to students or their families advances their goals that community school programs seek to achieve. So they're tying in the food program language in this bill to community schools, basically. Um, three um, is similar. Um, uh, they have a different language language um, after families. So you have uh, such a substance of misuse, lack of stable housing, inadequate medical and dental care, hunger, trauma, and exposure to violence. So students can do their best. Um, they have and build on the assets they bring to their schools and communities. Uh, community schools combine challenging and culturally inclusive learning opportunities with the academic and social supports every student needs to reach their potential. So some differences there. Um, four, the add language to four. So this four is about the um, pillars. Uh, and they're basically adding in a fifth pillar. So uh, four, uh, as you have it, identifies the four pillars and they do the same thing and then they add on that research additional supports the necessity of safe, inclusive and equitable learning environments to reinforce student success and well-being. These elements do not function independently but are instead part of a unified and interconnected approach. And you'll see that this uh, safe, inclusive, and equitable learning environments is now an additional additional pillar to the definition of community school programs, which we'll come on to. Uh, five is uh, similar. They've got some um, differences here. Um, so you've got um, uh, language around including, um, so this is research about improving the variety of student outcomes. And so you're saying including attendance, academic achievement, um, including racial, reducing racial and economic achievement gaps. They've got um, similar language, but um, uh, can result in improvements in a variety of student and family outcomes. 
including attendance, academic achievement, achievement, reducing systematic racial and economic injustices and inequities, et cetera. So similar, but somewhat different. Um, six is the same. Seven is the same, except they add language at the end. So seven is talking about the pandemic uh, and that uh, community schools are one of 10 recommended strategies for um, recovery. Um, and they wanted to say these schools at their core are about investing in children through quality teaching, challenging, engaging, and culturally responsive curricula, wraparound support, safe, trust, and for climate, strong ties to family and community, and a clear focus on student achievements, achievement and well being. They add a, a new eight which says that community centers are important centers for building community connections and resilience. Uh, when learning, learning extends beyond the walls of the schools through active engagement with community partners, as with place-based learning, relationships expand and deepen community strength and strengths are highlighted and opportunities for building uh, uh, vitality services through shared learning. Uh, nine is the same. This is looking at programs in various urban and rural areas. Um, so that is the same. They've added 10, which connects to literacy now. So uh, it says recognizing that literacy proficiency is a foundational learning skill. Community schools can advance the state goal of improving literacy for all students in the state. Achieving this goal will require a multi year and multi dimensional effort. According to can you focus by the General Assembly, the administration, and school leaders, and community schools are an important component. Of the effort, you can see some of this language from um, 114. Um, purpose. Um, so you've got that this law is enacted to support a demonstration grant program for the implementation of community school programs to provide students with equitable access. They've got this app provides funding for the implementation of community school programs that provide students with uh, same and then creates a task force. Two differences there. Uh, it's referencing the task force. It's also um, getting away from this grant language. So their version does not have a grant program. It permits the AOE to um, issue funding as it deems appropriate, um, but not necessarily through a grant application. And then the task force on university school lunch uh, has been added to their version, not in your version. And what the purpose should say, and it's missing one thing, mm -hmm. uh, is that the other thing this bill on their side does is to put in the farm to school language. And uh, that really should have been put in the purpose, but yeah. uh, it's not there. Um, okay, so going on to the funding. So again, uh, the, you've got a grant program, they've got a funding program. Um, the definition of a community school coordinator, I believe is the same. Um, Community school programs, uh, again, you've got four pillars. They've added a fifth, so they've got five pillars. And they've added a bunch of language into um, the definitions here. So I'm going to go through all of this, but I'll just read through the how that language to, to give you a sense of what they've added here. And the first pillar, which is integrated student supports, they're adding language that says, and, and include what young people bring to them to the classroom and the ways that schools and communities work together that uh, can, can enhance and embrace the knowledge and capacity that students and families can offer their schools. This could include educational strategies like universal design for learning, recognition and respect for cultural and linguistic diversity, and practices that focus on building and supporting relationships such as sort of practices. Do you know where that came um, from? They've added, um, I can't recall. No. Um, okay. I'm sorry. No. Uh, Voices for okay. Vermont's Children. All right. Okay. And then the expanded and rich learning time opportunities they want to have that during the school day as well. So that's been added, added there. Uh, active family and community engagement. Um, um, so, Let's just see, because you've got a may and they've got a shell. So, um, so they've added um, where all students and their families feel a sense of belonging and engagement 
and they say this shall include uh, broad student and community participation with a diversity of income, race, gender, newcomer status, language, and ability represented in the design, implementation, and evaluation of all activities that is embraced by the leaders and decision makers in schools and communities. You have um, uh, come off the same language hub. So hub is a common jumping out point here. So you've got your hub providing adults with a facility to access educational opportunities they want which may include coordinating services with outside providers, um, to offer English, et cetera. Um, so actually, yeah, they've got, sorry, your May is the same as their May, because their May is down here uh, on the next page. So it's not, they're not changing your May, so shall, they're um, adding language um, around, uh, Broad student participation. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then uh, they say this also provides us with the facility to access educational opportunities they want, which shall include access to evidence based literacy instruction. So that ties back to the finding literacy and may include, and that comes up to here and may include uh, on your side. So that's the same. Representative of Austin. Yes. Um, do they in the list of uh, qualities of the inclusiveness. Do they have people with handicapping conditions? Uh, are you looking at this? I, I think it's a, maybe on page nine. Sorry. Oh, I don't see it here on page, on this page. Go back up. You know, it was like about gender, um, social, you know, economic. It was just a list of different yeah, it's down below. We went to that. wasn't there. I was looking higher to see. We, we, we. No, it, it's not. So I think you, you're referring to is a list that is here. Uh, and this language here mm -hmm. does not include. Right, right. So yeah. is there a handicapping condition in there? I don't think it's in this language. Um, okay. I think it should be. Any amendments to this will mean that the bill fails this year. Okay, so we'll leave out handicapped. Um, we can go ahead and amend, amend it, but then it will sit on the calendar. It, it, will, it will mean that any further. We're out of time. If, if we amend it, then there are some amendments I would love to do. If we amend it, it will go over to the Senate and, and yeah. they- No, I don't want to hold up. I'm just, it's just yeah. disappointing to me that it's not in there, but I won't amend it. I won't hold this bill up. Okay, go ahead, Jim. Um, the next pillar is collaborative leadership and practices. Uh, and they've added some language here. So um, let's see, it. It come, so what this is about, of course, is um, collaborative leadership and practices. Um, and it's including a bunch of stuff here. And they've got, you've got um, on your side, left side, um, uh, and include a community school coordinator and a rep of uh, families in the community. and may include school, school district and other leadership governance teams. They've got, um, and include a community school coordinator and an integrated school and community leadership team that include youth and family reps and may include other leadership governance teams. I don't think the, the meaning's very different, um, but the words are definitely different. Larry, can you take over for a minute? Thank you. Go ahead, Jim. I see Rep. James has raised a hand. Okay, uh, oh, I didn't see that. Representative James. Yeah, thanks. Um, I just wanted to um, toss in a comment on this on the site based leadership team. Um, that was in the it, it was in the original 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 as introduced by the House bill. And um, it's an important sort of component in making sure that you've got kind of broad engagement and planning the community schools program and um, I just wanted to kind of reassure folks about that. I checked in with uh, Jay Nichols and um, the way it's worded doesn't get, doesn't raise any flags for them. So that was an addition I thought folks might want to hear a little bit more about because um, uh, anyway, that's, that's it. 
Okay. Uh, and then E they've added as a fifth pillar. So the fifth pillar is safe, inclusive, and equitable learning environments. Uh, they've taken out the um, demonstration grant definition because, again, this is not a grant program on their side, um, so no applications required. Um, they've expanded the definition definition of eligible applicant. So you've got either a school district with an eligible school or SU with an eligible school. Um, they, there's this recipient and the applicant because again, there's no application for a grant. It's this recipient of the funding. And uh, they've got uh, same A and B, so as you, they've added um, uh, C, which is two or more school districts each with one more eligible schools to see to work collaboratively to provide community school programs. And they've added D, which is two or more SUs doing the same thing. So they allow combinations of districts and SUs to work together. Um, eligible school is the same. Uh, Site-based leadership team, uh, they've added this definition over here, which reads, um, means an interdisciplinary <laughs> interdisciplinary, I can't pronounce it right now, sorry. Uh, we can see it. School-based leadership team that may include the school principal, the community school coordinator, teachers, and other school employees, students, families, community partners, nonprofit organizations, unions, and neighboring community residents that support, uh, that support uh, collaborative planning, implementation, and oversight of community school programs by the eligible recipient. Um, and then the funding authorization um, is different because um, they, again, it's a, it's a funding, not a grant, and it just says the secretary is authorized to provide you know, funding for a period of three years to an eligible recipient to use as required under subsection D, which is the uses of the fund provision. Um, so uh, th therefore they pick out your one and two, that's being done under their sub D. Um, but note that you had um, uh, grants of up to 110,000 um, uh, per eligible applicant. They've left that completely open. So they've left the Secretary of Education to determine how much to fund each, uh, uh, each uh, recipient. Um, so they, they've given more discretion to the agency than you, you have in, on your side. Um, funding administration, um, they, they've got um, that the secretary shall determine using the agency of education's equity lens tool, which recipients shall receive funding um, and the amount of funding. Um, and then that was subject to subdivision two, which requires collaboration. So we'll just go there for a minute before going back up. So, and making that determination about who gets the money and how much they get, uh, they have to work, the AOE has to work um, uh, to advance the principles of Vermont's trauma-informed system of care and has to collaborate with the Director of Trauma Pre Prevention and Resilience Development in the Vermont Child and family trauma working group. So um, that's what this reference to subject to subdivision two means. Mm -hmm. uh, and then going back down to what they left here um, on their side, in determining which eligible recipients shall receive funding, the secretary should take into account relative need based on the extent to which community school program services are needed and the extent to which eligible recipient seeks to offer them. So they've got that approach, which is much more kind of open-ended and has collaboration with um, uh, the um, trauma pre prevention folks. Uh, your side had um, Secretary mentioned the grant program on its own um, and determine the amounts. Um, so kind of a different approach here in terms of, of breadth and collaboration, I would say. Um, and then we go to um, uh, just a small change here, uh, eligible recipients, because um, it could be a combination of two or more SUs or two or more school districts as well. Um, 
and um, they put in uh, that that AOE shall inform everyone, but for those eligible recipients most in need of this funding, it should also educate them on what these programs do and, and uh, their benefits. Um, use of funding um, is not really different, but there's a lot of different language here because they've expanded quite a bit um, what you have. So let's just go through their version of it for a moment because um, I think in substance it's similar. Um, so their version says a recipient of funding under this act should use the funding too. So they say if a needs and assets assessment has not been conducted within the prior three years, that substantially co conforms with the requirements of this subdivision, then in collaboration with the site-based leadership team, conduct the needs and asset-based assessment that includes. So in the first year, if you haven't done a needs and asset-based assessment within the last three years, then the first year funding, you do that assessment. That assessment in the last three years, then you can just go on to implement. And the needs and asset-based assessment has a bunch of requirements here. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, all these are requirements that are not on your side. Um, and they came from uh, your original bill, actually. Uh, they were brought over. Uh, uh, NEA asked these, this language to be brought over from your, your H16 as to do. Okay. You've seen this language before. Um, and uh, it says that these asset investment sorry, it says that the needs and asset assessment must include where available and where applicable student demographic, academic achievement, and school climate data disaggregated by major demographic groups, including race, ethnicity, English language proficiency, students with, with IEPs, and students eligible for premium reduced price lunch status, um, has to include um, access to needs for integrated student support, access to, access to a need for expand, expanded and enriched learning time and opportunities, school funding information, including federal, state, local, private education funding for people spending, um, information on the number of qualification and stability of school staff, active family community engagement information, including these factors below. Um, so uh, need based on surveys, measures of family and community engagement, efforts to provide cultural and linguistically relevant communication, access and, access and need for family and community engagement activities. So they've added all this stuff in from your original goal. Um, so that details out what the needs and asset assessment must do. And then the, oh, I see it. Uh, Representative Austin. Yep. Can the school use the funds to get to this point to do all this assessment and gather this information and maybe apply the second of the third year? Because I think this is really good um, information for schools to have and gather. And I'm just wondering if the funding uh, as part of the grant could be used to gather this information, to get to the point where they could apply if they don't have this information? Yeah, so they don't have this information done. The first year of, grant, uh, of the funding, not grant funding, of the funding is September of this year. So um, if they're identified by AOE as being like in need of, of, of this kind of funding, if they want it, then they would, they would receive it. And then the first year they would do this needs and asset-based assessment. Great. Um, right. Thank you. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. We're in B here, but B is <laughs> jumping off point for B was a long time ago. So let's go back up and just make sure we know where we are. Um, so use of funding A, recipient funding in this actual use of funding two. We went through A, which is all the needs and asset based assessment stuff. And then B is um, uh, where did we go? B is here. Uh, B is to hire a community school coordinator to, in collaboration with the site-based leadership team, develop and implement community school programs, or designate a community school coordinator from existing personnel, and in collaboration with the site-based leadership team, 
augment work already being performed to develop and implement community school programs. Uh, and then C says, if the recipient has not fully implemented positive behavioral and related supports, provide professional development to staff on, on, on these, these supports and implement those supports. Um, Where did that come from? That came from, I'm not sure who, who the advocate was for that. I can't remember. Because there's, I, some, some use PBIS and some use another system. I've forgotten what it is, but it, well, let's look up. <clears throat> um, and then two says that I recipient of funding may use the funding to, in collaboration again with the Safety Leadership Team, develop and implement a plan to improve literacy outcomes. So again, time back to literacy, uh, and this is in May, not shall. And then three says that if a needs asset assessment has not been conducted um, uh, within the prior three years, the first year funding should be used to conduct that assessment. Um, and then second, third year should be used to um, implement um, the plan. Um, evaluation language is the same, both sides. Um, they've added this language about ability to operate in community school. So any school district or school, regardless of whether it, it receives funding in this act, may function as a community school as defined. Um, and then appropriation of funds is the same. And then they've added all this language on locally produced foods. Um, have we been through this before? We did. Uh, we did go through this, as I remember, and we had a group of people in here. Is that the committee's memory as well? That we did have an opportunity to to review this language, setting up the 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 the, the various programs, the task force, and the um, okay. And the so maybe actually just summarize what this is rather than going through yeah. it in detail, uh, and we can go back through it again. Representative like. Austin. Yep. Is this the same as 106? This is 106. Uh, this is 106, yep. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm, so, I'm confused. Sorry. I just thought 106 was the uh, use of locally produced foods. S100 was. Um, okay. It originally appeared in S100, got stripped out of there. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's been various places. So I'm not surprised of anyone's confusion, including my own. <laughs> Yeah, no, it is confusing. This was 106. I was just confused why uh, I, th I thought we were going to be discussing the uh, locally produced foods. We will uh, in here. Later? It, it's in it, this bill. It's in, okay. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. For the... it, it's, been, it's been a little confusing. <laughs> so it's right here on the right-hand column in yellow. Uh, again, we'll go through it all. It's a very complex language, really, but what this does, um, I'll just say it before scrolling through, is that it, it provides a grant program, establishes a grant program to encourage school districts to buy locally produced foods. Uh, the first year of that grant program, school districts can use their own definition of what locally produced means. And if they, I believe it's if they hit 15% um, or maybe it's 20%, if they hit a certain percentage of uh, locally produced using their own definition, they get uh, a grant of 15 cents per lunch um, served. Then after the first year, uh, if they want to continue, then they would have to use the state definition of locally produced foods. Uh, and if they hit 15% based on the state definition, they get 15 cents per meal. If they hit 20%, uh, they get 20 cents per meal. If they hit 25%, they get 25 cents per meal. So that's what this is doing. Um, so without going through all the language, just briefly, uh, D here creates the, the grant authority uh, for this program. Uh, and then you go over to a new section we're adding, which is uh, locally produced food section, which is 26, 1264A, uh, establishes a goal of by 2023, having at least 20% of uh, foods purchased by SUs and uh, SDs are being locally produced, uh, has a reporting requirement based on local definitions. And then it says beginning with the uh, 21, 22 school year, 
um, you can apply for a grant using your own definition. And you have to meet certain conditions. So um, uh, you have to have developed a purchasing, purchasing plan for locally produced foods, have an individual as a food coordinator for that program, develop a process of tracking, and comply with the reporting requirements that we just went through above. If, that, if you've done that, then you get your grant. Um, if you have, let's see, see where it is. It's, I think it's, um, yeah, 15 cents per uh, lunch. So if you if you meet the threshold, you get 15 per lunch. And the th threshold is, where is it? Uh, oh, no threshold, sorry. If you meet those four conditions without any percentage, you get 15 cents. Um, per school lunch. Then after that, um, you're using the state definition. And uh, again, it goes through what the state definition is. It's cross-reference to the ag provision, uh, excluding fluid milk, because fluid milk uh, would, would be uh, often 20% already you buy uh, locally as fluid milk. So they want to just automatically qualify you for what you're doing already. That's been excluded from the definition. And then if they um, hit the various percentages, uh, they get, again, uh, 15 cents if you hit 15%, 20 cents if you hit 20%, and 25 cents if you hit 25% of locally produced foods. Um, and we'll go through all of this. The, the agency has the right to audit. Um, there's obviously reporting uh, required, required uh, to you uh, back on uh, what's going on and that's it so that, that's the whole section there in, in a high, high level summary uh staffing um section eight creates a staffing position at the agency uh to specialize in the administration of school food programs and there's an appropriation of a hundred thousand from the general fund in fiscal 22 for that and then i think we've been through the task force in university school lunch uh, this would create that task force uh, with the goal of how by 26, 27 school year, you can get to universal school lunch and therefore get to universal school meals. Uh, membership of the uh, secretaries of these three agencies, education, human services, and ag. Um, and um, so I want to all the specific duties. I will note that the tricky one is two here. It's how you collect the data. Uh, when there's no incentive for parents to try and the current data required for um, free and reduced lunch because it's universal. So you have to have a different uh, data collection process uh, for that. So um, collaboration with a bunch of V's and the other folks reporting back, of course, uh, next year. Um, and that's really... Yeah, so, and then the effective date is on passage. Let me just take this down for a moment. Thank you. Um, Jesse, I know that uh, the um, Ag Committee sent a letter to me that I now can't seem to find. Um, would you contact, and I think it came from the, the Ledge Council, the, the ledge assistant in, in ag, would you uh, be willing to just contact her and see if she could send that again and send it to you? I actually have that here from Linda. I'm happy to share it if you'd like. Oh, great, thank you very much. This is what you were thinking of? Yes, is this, what's it say here? <laughs> Okay, so they, they support they support all the language in S100. What this doesn't have is the universal breakfast. Um, that's in S100, but that did not make it over into H106. The universal breakfast uh, is covered by the federal government through next year, and we'll have an opportunity to look at S100 next year. There's not an emergency on that. Um, but I, I thought we should at least note that the Ad Committee has take, taken a look at this language. Okay, so 
Uh, Representative James? Yeah, I just wanted to remind myself, um, the funding for the local incentives grant program, is that in this bill or is that already, that's in the budget, right? 500,000, yep. I believe. 500,000, yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, I just wanted to, we've got a few folks in the room. Um, I just wanted to first check with Rosie Kruger. Are you going to be able to uh, support this process? Will the staffing uh, provide enough support for you uh, in, in this endeavor? Yeah, um, we, with the additional position that's included, we can implement this grant program as it's written um, in the bill. Okay. And we can certainly take a look next year in January and see if there are tweaks that we need to do to it, um, but at least gets this, this going. Um, uh, any other questions for um, Rosie Kruger, who handles? handles all things nutrition in, in the agency. Yeah, I'm sorry. I should have said for the record, um, yeah. Rosie Kruger, Vermont Agency of Education, State Director of Child Nutrition Programs. No, yeah, we appreciate your work uh, very much. Um, we have a few other folks in the room wanted to check in with the uh, Teachers Association. You actually brought a lot of this original language to us and wanted to um, see uh, how it looks now, now that it's fully clothed. Yeah, wonderful. Good morning, folks. For the record, Colin Robinson, Vermont NEA. Um, first of all, thanks for the great work on 106. Um, and the fact that we're here now is a testament to the work that, that you did. Um, you know, the Senate did, I think, some additional tuning to sort of address some of the targeting that came up. You might remember there was a floor amendment around making sure that the right schools were able to access this. And I think some of the language that the Senate brought into this addresses that and also ensures that there's um, some strong collaboration at the local level. So we um, continue to support it and are excited about the prospect of moving this forward to support students. The one um, other little thing I'll note is some of the language that you saw in the Senate version that uh, is new around trauma. Um, Senator Lyons, of course, is the chair of the Senate Health and Welfare Committee. She's deeply connected into the conversations about um, adverse childhood experiences and trauma. And she brought that into the Senate conversation. And um, so that's why some of those things uh, emerged in this, in their adjustments to the bill, I believe. So she and I, she and I participated in a, in a work group on uh, adverse childhood experiences and trauma um, a couple of yeah. years ago. Yeah. It's appropriate addition. Absolutely. Um, and wanted to reach out to the um, principals, Jay Nichols. Good morning, everybody. Jay Nichols for the record, executive director of the Vermont Principals Association. Uh, we were able to work, actually worked a lot with Vermont NEA and obviously with Rep James when the bill was uh, over here. And we're able to work some with Senator Campion uh, and Vermont NEA to make a few language changes that we felt needed to happen. Uh, to make sure that the bill actually complied with Vermont law. And I think the way it is right now, it's very strong. I also concur that the language that was added in by Senator Lyons is appropriate uh, and very useful. And I was glad to see that addition. So I think it's a very strong bill and we are support in support of it. And the school boards. Good morning, everyone. Sue Siglowski, Vermont School Boards Association. Um, I don't have really much to add to what uh, Jay just said, other than um, you know he, he noted that there, we did have some concerns about the language um, in the Senate and those concerns were addressed in the um, Senate proposal of amendment. Thank you. Thank you. And do we have the superintendents? Sure, they're here. Jeff Francis is not with us right now, but he- okay. He did tell us to tell you that he con concurs with this, okay. the uh, school boards and principals. Okay. So um, this is on the notice calendar. Uh, we don't have possession. So I would like to take a straw poll uh, on whether to support and or if there's any other further discussion on this bill. Um, Representative Cooperly. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> um, 
Jim, if or uh, Brianne, maybe you can help me a little bit with the funding mechanism. We have now gone from a grant program to the Agency of Education, um, supporting this financially for the three-year period and thereafter. A am I correct in that assumption? Uh, almost. Um, so yes, we moved from a grant program to the agency, basically determining who should get the money based on need and desire um, and how much to get. Again, working in collaboration with the trauma folks. Um, it's funding for three years, um, but not beyond. So after three years, the grant fund, sorry, not grant funds, the funding ends. And then if the schools wanted to carry on their program, I assume that it would be out of the school budget or maybe there'll be another, another state program, I'm not sure, but. Okay, thank you. And our bill, as you remember, was developed, uh, it passed before ARPA. So remember, we did a similar thing with um, the literacy bill. We moved it from a, a grant program to, to it, it, it made it less clumsy once, once we knew they had the ARPA funds. Um, Representative James. But the funding source is still the ARPA money. Yes. Not off the top of the ed fund. Right. That is only for the trial period, the three years. After that, it goes to the ed fund. Actually, the ed fund is going to be paying for it now anyway, because they've dis they they've disallowed the grant program in the Senate, if I'm not mistaken. It's SRF three funds funding this program for three years. That's right. Yeah. And then after, after that, the, after that, it goes to the ed fund. It goes to local budgets, and therefore the ed fund. Yeah. Ed fund. yeah. And is, is there, I mean, at that point, how many, let's say that another 10 or so school districts or SUs decide, like, decide they'd like to join this program or apply for the program, um, is, there, is there any stop gaps there in terms of funding? So after three years, there's no further funding, so they can't get further state funding unless you do something more. Yeah. I, I think again- Thank you. A, Go ahead. Thank you. I was just gonna say that this would be a, a local decision. So school budgets could decide and the, the townspeople would vote to approve or not approve the budget. Representative James. I just wanted to respond a little bit to um, Representative Kupali. So um, the, the structure of the funding hasn't changed from the bill that we passed out. So you're tapping into ESSER three funds for a three year, uh, it, it basically remains a three year demonstration project. What's changed is that instead of schools or districts applying for a competitive grant program, the AOE is going to, um, reach out to schools that they think are best qualified and say, hey, would you like to do this? And if they're interested, then they'll participate in the three-year demonstration grant program. At the end of that three-year program, it ends. Um, there is no obligation in this bill for the Ed Fund to pick up that cost at all. And the only cost that would, that would carry on to the districts would be if districts decide to retain their community school coordinator because that's the only cost of the program is hiring a community school coordinator who's embedded at the district level, or as we've seen even across several districts. And as we know from our research um, and everything that we've learned about community schools, um, they can tap into, um, once they're up and running, they qualify for other federal funding streams, they qualify um, or aim to seek from uh, community funding, and most of them survive on um, braided funding sources that it takes a few years to kind of get up and moving. 
So at the end of three years, there's no there's no obligation at all for this to become an ed fund cost. I would imagine that at that point, the programs would have proved themselves and local voters will have a chance to decide whether they'd like to retain their community schools coordinator and keep moving with it. And if other schools would like to give this a shot, um, they can look at, you know, eight, 10, 12 schools that have been doing this across the state using this one time money and decide whether they'd like to give it a go. I think that basically is my concern. It is one time money. And certainly I think all of you appreciate my concern about <clears throat> how we continue to load up the education fund in our state. And it's, it's becoming it's becoming a real problem. And I think we need to be cognizant of the fact that, that these programs as we continue to develop, I'm not, a, I think it's a great idea, but I just can't support um, adding to the ed education fund. I just can't do it um, in, in, in all good conscience. Uh, thank you. And you do recognize that this bill does not affect the ed fund. You, you, I just clarify that. I think it will affect the ed fund in future years. I, I, I'm almost certain it will um, at some point, in particular taking away from the grant, uh, taking the grant funding away. Representative Tooth. Thanks, Chair Webb. Um, I also just want to voice uh, some of my concerns are similar to Representative Coakley's. Um, just in the future, I'm looking at this going on to the Ed Fund. I think we're jumping the gun on this. This is something that I think we're kind of putting the cart before the horse, I think. Um, with our with 426 coming out, we're looking at what schools are going to look like, um, what kind of uh, investments we're going to put into it. I think this is something that we could go uh, down the line, we could look into, but I do think that um, this could be a burden on the tax on the Ed Fund three, four, five, maybe even 10 years from now. Um, so that's where I was, I was caught up when it, it originally left. I do like the school, the school lunch uh, portion of this bill. I, I'm, I'm a big supporter of that. I voiced that um, before in this committee. So I just wanted to give my couple of thoughts about my concerns with this bill and why I can't support it. So, and, and I know that uh, Representative James and I have had talked in length about how much I do support this idea. I just don't think we're there yet. And um, I appreciate all the hard work from everyone in this committee um, on this. And I thank everyone for coming in, but I, I just right now in 2021, I'm just not ready for it. Thank you. Representative Austin. Yep. Uh, I will support this bill, but I really share Representative Cooperly and Representative Tooth's concern about the pressure on the Ed Fund. I mean, healthcare is rising 11%. We have the pension uh, coming up. We have huge uh, funding issues. And I mean, I was just reading yesterday that the uh, incredible impact they're finding now about preschool on successful lives and academic achievement. Just data is coming out more and more about the power of good preschool programs. And, you know, I'm hoping that we can um, move some of the preschool programs into the public schools, you know, in order to advance academic achievement. Um, because I, I really think that's what is going to help, you know, less fortunate children, um, you know, um, diverse communities of children, the best thing that can happen for them is to for them to graduate 12th grade with the skills and knowledge and um, values that are going to make them contributing members to society. And all these ideas are great. It's not like, you know, uh, universal school lunch and this aren't wonderful ideas. It's just, you know, I think we really have to start prioritizing what is really going to help kids um, be successful once they leave the 12th grade. Um, so I, I'm very concerned about uh, these programs that we're adding um, and, and not looking at what the priorities are and the, the costs that we're beginning to incur or are incurring. So that's just, I, I, I will support this bill. Representative Brown. Well, thank you, Chair Webb. I just want to say how excited I am that this committee has spent so much time working on this bill this year. And I think one of the really um, important elements for me and one of the reasons that I so strongly support the work that we've done 
is the testimony that we heard from the national experts around um, just how timely this community schools model is as we look towards COVID recovery. Um, and I also think, um, you know, one of the great, um, one of the best elements of this kind of program is the flexibility that it allows for communities in terms of assessing their needs and really taking a tailored approach that's specifically gonna address the needs that they see within their schools and their communities. So um, I think it's a great step forward as we, as we move into the pandemic recovery phase. And I certainly hope that we can move this across the finish line. Representative Williams. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I will be supporting this bill um, because when you, set, when you set the good and the bad on the scale, uh, the good outweighs. As you know, my biggest concern is what everyone else is concerned about is the Ed Fund. We have to take care of that. It's going to come back to bite us someday. But the good right now is, is um, going to take priority for today. Representative James. Thanks, Chair Webb. I, you know, I just wanted to go back to the to the research here because, um, you know, the reason I think it's so important to move this bill this year is because we have this very unique opportunity to tap into federal stimulus funds for this um, to get these programs, you know, up and running, and get them to the point where they can be self sufficient. Um, you know, that takes a couple of years. So we have the chance to fund this program right now without going to the Ed Fund. And if, you know, I, I don't, didn't have my research ready for today, but um, in studying this bill, you know, I went back to all of the academic studies that have been done showing that community schools pay returns on investment anywhere from three to $15 for every buck you, you invest once these schools are up and running, they start bringing resources flowing into those schools. And, you know, I did want to also um, mention to people is that, you know, it's certainly not a, a slam dunk, but the Biden administration is very supportive of full service community schools. And they are talking about hundreds of millions of dollars coming down the pike for community schools. And um, I think that speaks to, you know, a future source of federal funding. If we've got a community schools model up and running here that we've managed to establish as a demonstration project, you know, we'll have some schools that are doing it. We'll have a lot of lessons learned about how we can make these schools successful. And we will be well positioned, I think, to tap into those, some of those federal funds if they start coming down the pike. So this is one of those examples of looking ahead and trying to position ourselves for the future of education. Representative Cooperly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, again, I will caution on one-time monies in, in spending one-time funds. Um, and I would also say that we can't look and hope and if funding is gonna be available two years, three years, four years, or even longer from the federal government. Um, I think we're gonna find some, some issues of inflation that will create um, the federal government to just stop funding a lot of things as well. And I look at that from an from a economic standpoint, and I, I think we need to be um, certainly aware of federal funding can stop any day if in fact it even comes to us. Um, I know that we're talking about <clears throat> um, infrastructure funding. Um, that bill in the, in, the, in the Senate and the House in Washington is, is under a lot of scrutiny. And I, I would be very, very cautious about looking, to, looking into the future in terms of spending. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna close in just a minute here, but what I wanna say is how many times have we heard schools, communities say, the school is the heart of our community. Well, I say then make it so. How the community wraps around the students in those schools is probably going to have a far bigger effect on those students, particularly children in trauma, than the ex explicit difference in the math program. The community is going to have the biggest effect. And I think that this is a way of at least getting a start to see 
if indeed this model will work and providing that opportunity for, for our, our, our students and our schools, I think is, is terrific. And with that, I would like to take, um, can we in support of the Senate amendment um, would like to just uh, do a, a check here and I'm just gonna go around the room and do a little count here. So uh, we'll start with uh, Representative Austin. I, I, I either give me a thumbs up or say yes, okay. <laughs> yes. Um, Representative Brown. Um, Representative James. Yes. Representative Arison. Yes, um, yes. Representative Hooper. Yes. Representative Brady. Yes. Representative Conlon. Yes. Representative Toof. No. Representative Cooperly. No. Representative Webb, yes. Did I miss somebody? You miss me. I miss you. <laughs> Representative Williams. <laughs> yes. Good. Okay, thank you. Um, good work. Uh, Kathleen, you will be the reporter. Uh, of the yes, ma'am. And uh, we'll talk as soon as we, we head to the floor just on, on timing on this. Thank you, everybody.